You know, they asked Mitch two ways about that, and the answer was the same. We're not going to have any government shutdowns. We're not going to have any threats of impeachment. We're going to return to regular order and show America how the Senate is supposed to work, how the founding fathers intended for us to move legislation through an open process, unlimited debate, working into the night, working on Mondays and Fridays for a change like the American people do, and sending legislation to the House and onto the president, right. for, hopefully for his signature. All right, signature. Uh, hey, you know, Mississippi, I respect that. Uh, that is uh, Senator uh, Wicker, uh, who's now been elected the chairman of the National Republican Senatorial Committee. Joining us now is Steve King, Republican from Iowa, a member of the House Judiciary Subcommittee on Immigration and Border Security. Hello, Congressman. Hello, Steve. Good to be back with you again. Well, always good to talk to you. All right, so let me ask you a question. Why is it that if the government gets shut down over this immigration uh, uh, executive order, that it's going to be the Republicans who are shutting it down. If, if the country says don't do it to Obama, which they have, and the Republicans have warned Obama don't do it, which they have, and he does it, and they decide we're not going to let him do it, and he doesn't sign a bill that defunds it, why is it the Republicans who are, why is he admitting or saying as a Republican that we're not going to shut the government down? I think you've actually just answered that in the, in the question is if, if Republicans, and, and especially when it's Republican leadership, steps up and says there will be no government shutdown, we're not going to shut the government down, then they position themselves to take the blame when the president right. brings it about. Crazy. And plus, you're... And you're, you're furthermore, you're, you know, if, I just, if I listen to that, to that response, when it says that our, you know, our founding fathers of the Constitution wants us to pass with legislation... Um, come in early and stay late and pass legislation. No, when I read the Constitution, it says Congress has the power of the purse. Congress has the enumerated power uh, for naturalization and, by strong implication, immigration policy. And Congress has also other powers to restrain an, an overreaching executive branch. Our founding fathers wanted us to do that. And they want us to be the voice of the people, and that's why we have elections in the House every two years. All right. Do you see it coming to that? Do you see if the president goes ahead with this, which all indications are he will, we even know the parameters, they've been leaked, and he's also, uh, you know, talked about it. Uh, will the leadership, will, the, will the, uh, the, the, the Congress say, we're not funding it, and then put the bill on his desk, and if he vetoes it, then he shuts down the government. I mean, will it come to that? I, I think it, it, it may come to that. I hope it doesn't come to that. I hope the president reconsiders and takes a deep breath and revisits his oath of office. So I don't expect that. I hope that happens. Uh, but if he if he pulls the trigger on executive amnesty, and it, it looks to me like it has to be a, just a gross, obscene violation of the Constitution. If he does that, I think that's when that's when the House and the conservatives in the Senate get their back up immediately. Now I've had trouble convincing them that we should go deeply into the decisions on how we strategize in the hypothetical scenario of the president violating the Constitution. They just didn't seem to want to light up on that in August, for example, right. or September. Now I can see it. I can see their blood pressure going up. The more imminent it is, the more likely the members of Congress are to keep their oath of office and defend All the right, so, 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 so let me just ask you to be clear. In your view, if it comes to that uh, scenario, which you don't want it to come to, but if it does, it would be the president who is shutting down the government, correct? It would, it, and we set that standard. Yes is the yes is the answer to that. And we set spending bills over to the to the Senate a year and a couple of months ago. There was a there it resulted in a government shutdown. We funded everything except Obamacare. Harry Reid refused to take them up, and the president yep. refused to sign them. Yep. All right, so let, it's on them, not us. Let me ask you. This is there's a story out of Iowa that uh, there's a lot of dissatisfaction and unhappiness, or let me say, lack of excitement over Hillary. Uh, in the state of Iowa. Do, do you believe that that's true? Have you heard any rumblings? Have you seen any uh, evidence of that? Yes, in fact, I, I read a story on that, and when I, when I saw the headline on the story, I thought, whoever wrote that story got it. They got it figured out. Um, yes, there's a lack of excitement is maybe an understatement. Um, the fingernails on the chalkboard was Hillary's return to the Tom Harkin steak fry when she stepped up to the podium on the hay rack and said in, in perfect uh, screechy voice, I'm back, uh, that, that will play over and over again in Iowa. And, and I think that if I were a young up-and-coming Democrat, I might look at running for presidency. All right, uh, very quickly also, the keystone. The president has given every indication from what he said in his last press conference in Asia. Uh, it sounds to me like he, he's given every reason for that he's going to veto it, no matter how, how much it passes by. Well, he is a stubborn man. 
And, uh, you know, the, he's, I've just first heard him talk in the last few days about why he's against it, because this oil might be available on the global market. I don't, I don't know whether, whether he understands that we do have a global market for oil. And the more available oil is to us, the cheaper it will be to us. Right. So, so uh, I don't see, and, and the Canadians, um, and, I, and I've dealt with the Canadians for several years on this, they will build a pipeline to the Pacific, and they will send heavy yep. Canadian crude to China to be refined. Yep, that's the, that's the sad part. Mm -hmm. uh, Congressman, always great to talk to you, sir. We'll talk to you soon. Always my pleasure. Thank Thanks you, Congressman Steve. Steve King. And we'll be back with the Molesburg panel, folks, after the break. But first, August 6, 1945. The U.S. became the first and only nation to use atomic weaponry when it dropped an atomic bomb on Hiroshima. And now let's take a look back at that fateful day with this hour's American Moment. Four years, eight months, and one day after the Japanese surprise attack on Pearl Harbor, marking America's entrance into World War II, a B-29 bomber nicknamed the Enola Gay dropped the world's first atomic weapon. The date was August 6th, 1945. In a split second, the world had entered the nuclear age. Captain Paul Tibbetts, Jr., in command of the Enola Gay, gave a first-hand account of the events for reporters back home. Well, as the bomb left the airplane, we took over uh, manual control, made an extremely steep turn to try and put as much distance between ourselves and the explosion as possible. With the Japanese refusing to surrender, and Allied intelligence determining that a land invasion of their homeland could result in a million Allied casualties while killing many more Japanese. President Truman ordered the first atomic bomb be dropped on Hiroshima. Dubbed Little Boy, the device exploded 1,900 feet above the awakening Japanese city of Hiroshima, instantly reducing 68,000 of the city's buildings to rubble and annihilating some 80,000 plus people. Despite the devastation, the Empire of Japan again refused to surrender. Consequently, three days later, on the 9th, a second atomic weapon was dropped on the city of Nagasaki with the same devastating results. Still, the Japanese refused to surrender. So a third atomic bomb was being prepared to be dropped on Tokyo itself. On the 15th of August, 1945, the Emperor of Japan had announced the unconditional surrender of his nation. The greatest war known to man was finally over. For Newsmax TV, I'm Bill Curtis, and this is an American Moment.